And uh, today, uh, before I call the kids up, I'm going to have the kids come up in a moment. Before I do that, I want to take a couple minutes at the start of our service today to talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to be talking about throughout this year. Because we are entering into a very historic year this year. It's 2017, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. So last year, there was a small group of us from the church made up of your board, some of your board members, uh, some of your staff, and, and some of you. And that group of us spent eight months last year working with a consultant. And uh, the purpose was to help us fine-tune and put in writing who we are as a church, our mission as a church. We did that for a couple reasons. First of all, we did it to make sure that for years to come, generations to come, we'll know who we are because it's real easy to deviate from your mission. So we'll know who we are, what God has called us to do as a church. Second reason why we did it for a uh, more short term is we're going to hopefully be calling a new pastor uh, in 2017, an associate pastor. So it's important for us to be clear on who we are so we know what kind of pastor we're looking for. And it's important for that pastor to know who we are as we make decisions together about each other. And uh, so we worked uh, for eight months on tweaking our mission statement uh, we laid out our values, which are sort of those foundational statements, those things we believe in that are important. We created an icon. Some of you have seen it already up on our Facebook page of our strategy here at church. And a lot of these different things that we've written, we'll, we'll make sure we get out to you now in the next few weeks. But near the end of the process, we were asked to create measures. And measures are important because they answer the question, are we really doing what we're called to do? And how do we know we're really doing it? I mean, you can say you're doing it, but how do you prove you're actually doing it? How do you measure it? And since our mission really is to follow Jesus on the bold, reckless adventure of grace, the question then was, what does that look like? What does the follower of Jesus look like? What does a Christian look like? What does it look like to become a Christian? And that's where we hit a problem. Because when you start to make a list of what a Christian looks like, or what a follower of Jesus looks like, or what it takes to become a Christian, you're no longer talking about Christianity. Because Christianity has everything to do with what God has done for us and nothing to do with what we do for God. Christianity is not defined by our actions, but by the action of God through Christ. And so Christianity is not an if-then religion. If I do certain things, then God will love me. Christianity is far more radical than that. It is a because-therefore movement of the gospel, a movement of God. Because God acts in Jesus, therefore, I can live as a free person, free to live as a forgiven person. It's not if then, it's because-therefore. Now, the church loses sight of that easily because we live in an if-then world. We're always trying to do certain things in order to get certain things. And 500 years ago, the church had lost its way. And it had really become an if-then church. If we do all of these things for God, then God will love us, then God will accept us. Martin Luther was a German monk at that time who struggled with that. He was living under the immense pressure of always trying, trying to please God. And as it was, he was studying Scripture, and as he heard the word of God's grace, it changed him. It freed him up from having always to prove himself to God, this if-then religion, and freedom to live as a forgiven person, a because-therefore experience of God. And he began to talk about that, and it changed Christianity, and we rediscovered the power of radical grace through him. And so that's why we're celebrating 500 years of the Protestant Reformation, officially in October. Now, Luther has said a lot of different things that really help us capture the scandal of the gospel. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I use it all the time. You've heard it before. Please be aware of aspiring to such purity that you no longer wish to be looked upon as a sinner or to be one, for Christ dwells only in sinners. And that's the radical message of Christianity. Jesus came only for sinners. He came only for lost people. He came only for those who are away from God. He came for the wrong kinds of people. So what we're going to be doing now over this next year is we're going to be joining with congregations all around the world, and we're going to deep dive into this radical gospel that Martin Luther rediscovered. And we're going to do a lot of different things throughout the year to help us really live in that grace together. So what we're going to do to start these next few weeks, next five weeks, is we're going to look at the measures that we finally came up with. 
And we created uh, five measures using the word grace. Each letter starts, stands for a different measure. And so we said this, a Christian is defined, or a Christian looks like this. A Christian is one who has been grasped by grace, is rooted in grace, is affirmed by grace, is called by grace, and is empowered by grace. And hopefully you'll notice as we go along, none of that has to do with us. It has everything to do with what God does. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one of these aspects of our measures, each one of these aspects of grace, and we're going to pair it with a story from Jesus from uh, Luke's gospel. So today, our story comes from Luke 15. The religious leaders catch Jesus red-handed, eating with the wrong kinds of people. In that culture, when you eat with someone, it means that you're equal. And so Jesus is eating with sinners, people who weren't taking the time to do all the right things to get God to love them. And he was eating with tax collectors, Roman collaborators, the wrong kinds of people. The religious leaders complained about that because they believed that these people had already been condemned by God and couldn't understand why Jesus, a religious leader, would defile himself with those kinds of people. Now, the religious leaders aren't necessarily bad people. They love God. They want what's best for God and God's people, but they believe that if you work hard enough, then God will love you, and since sinners don't work hard enough, God can't love them. And so they're outraged that Jesus would be hanging with them at all. So Jesus, rather than trying to give an explanation for it, tells three stories. Three lost and found stories. The story of a woman who lost her coins and found them. The story of a father who finds his two sons. And the story we're going to look at today, the story of a shepherd who finds his lost Kids, today we're playing bingo. And some of you have done that with us before. But essentially, there'll be some words I say throughout the sermon today that summarize what we're talking about. They'll come up on the screen. You can just check them off. It's a way to help you listen. And then there'll also be some pictures that you can draw on the other side of the sheet if you'd like to help you visualize and illustrate uh, as we go along today. So we're going to talk about the shepherd who grasps us in his grace. Before we do that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, you love us and how profound that statement really is. Uh, in spite of what others will try to tell us, you're a God of love and grace. And we pray today that we would uh, dive deep again into that promise for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Sheep have a tendency to nibble their way to lostness. Uh, sheep uh, love to eat, and so they tend to live with their heads down. They're not aware of their surroundings. They're just focused on the grass in front of them. And if they're not aware, which they usually aren't, they can nibble their way, moving from tuft of grass to tuft of grass. They can soon nibble their way away from their shepherd and away from the flock. Now, sheep don't do this because they're bad sheep. They do it because they're hungry. And to put it in spiritual terms, it's like likely to say that what sheep are doing is they're nibbling their way to lostness all the while believing they're nibbling their way to salvation because they're feeding themselves. This is the way to life, and they end up getting lost. And when a sheep realizes it's lost, it goes into a full-blown panic mode. It starts to shake uncontrollably. It begins to bleat loudly and becomes so exhausted that it collapses and is paralyzed with fear. And in that moment, it can't move. It can't stand. It can't walk. It can't run. And so it becomes extremely vulnerable. Vulnerable to robbers, vulnerable to predators. That sheep, when it's lost, is as good as dead and can't do anything about it unless someone comes to rescue it. Now, the religious leaders came to Jesus one day, and they're complaining because Jesus was eating with the wrong kinds of people, the people that God doesn't love, the people that God has written off. And so Jesus tells them a story about a sheep that wanders away. And again, it's not so much about the sheep as it is about the shepherd. Jesus says that this shepherd will risk his life to find the sheep that's lost. Now, most of us live in suburbia, most of us haven't been around a lot of sheep farms in Israel, so we don't really have a context for how it is that a shepherd's risking his life to find a sheep. But there are a lot of things happening in that culture. First of all, the terrain itself was very, very rugged. You always had to watch your step there because of the way the terrain worked. Secondly, there were predators out there looking for sheep. And they wouldn't stop at killing a shepherd to get sheep once in a while. And robbers were out there trying to steal sheep, and they would take on shepherds as well. So when a shepherd heads out on his own to find one lost sheep, he's risking his life. 
And when he finds that sheep, the risk gets even higher because now he has to pick up this sheep because it can't move. It's still shaking uncontrollably. It's still screaming. And he has to carry, pick up this dead weight sheep weighing about 70 some pounds, put it on his shoulders, hold on to it, and walk across that rugged terrain, potentially fighting off predators and robbers in the process. He sacrifices his life to find and rescue that one lost sheep. And it's important to note again that that sheep cannot save itself. It is incapable, it is impossible. The sheep is lost completely unless someone saves it. So what Jesus wants to say to those religious leaders is this. These people that I'm hanging out with, that you've written off, that you said that God has already condemned, these people that are irredeemable, these are precisely the people that I've come for. In fact, God sent me for these people because these people matter to God, and God loves them. In fact, God cares only about lost people. He only cares, cares about sinners. Those are the only people that he comes for, and that's why I'm here. Now, that's good news for all of us because all of us find ourselves in the lost camp. Like sheep, we nibble our way to lostness. Now, we're all church people. We've all cleaned ourselves up pretty well. And it's easy for us, like those religious leaders, to look at the people who aren't here. And you know who I'm talking about. Your neighbors, the people you work with, those people who cut you off on the road. Those are really sinners. I mean, those are bad people. Those are irredeemable people. Now, we know we're, we're all sinners, but our sin is not nearly as bad as their sin. We're not nearly as lost, right? It's easy to get into that habit. What Jesus wants to say is, it doesn't matter the depth of lostness. We're all lost, and we all nibble our way to lostness. Started with Adam and Eve when they nibbled their way to lostness by eating the forbidden fruit. They did it because they thought they were saving themselves. This, eating that fruit, they were promised by the devil that it would make them wise and make them like God. But the more they ate that fruit, the more lost they became, and suddenly they're hiding in terror from God, paralyzed with fear. And that has been our legacy ever since, nibbling our way to lostness, trying to fill the void, trying to save ourselves, hoping if we nibble on the right thing, we'll find our sweet spot in life. Sometimes we'll nibble on things that are really bad for us, that take us into some really dark places. But a lot of times we nibble on things that are good for us and they lead us astray. Because we hope that that thing we're nibbling on will fill the void. And so we just say to ourselves, if only I make enough money, then I can be happy. And so we're constantly nibbling on trying to make more money. If I lose some weight or if I build a better body, I'll be more attractive to people. And so we're constantly nibbling on all of those things to make ourselves healthy. If I clean myself up, then God will love me. And none of those things are necessarily bad. The problem is we get caught in this vicious cycle of if-then living that condemns us. Because if is never enough. We never get to then because we're always constantly trying to find if and nibble more and more. And the more we nibble on if, the more lost we become. We become overly busy. We become frustrated. We become disillusioned. We become stressed out. And we never really live. We're so busy trying to find it. We nibble ourselves to lostness. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's a vicious trap we can't get out. And that's why the gospel is so radical, because the gospel doesn't say you've got to figure a way out of it. The gospel says that God sent Jesus to find you and grasp you in his grace and rescue you. And you can't do anything but relax in that grace. So Jesus is the good shepherd who runs to us in the darkest places where we're lost, and he finds us, and he rescues us. He doesn't wait for us to act first because we can't. He doesn't wait for us to call on him first because we won't. He doesn't condemn us for getting lost in the first place. He simply runs to us out of love, finds us, holds us in the grasp of his grace, and because we are saved by grace, because we are in the grasp of God's grace, we therefore are free to live as forgiven people. Before Emperor Constantine outlawed the cross as a form of execution, Many of the early Christians used not the cross as a symbol of Christianity, but the shepherd carrying the sheep because they understood the great sacrifice that came, that Jesus is the shepherd who comes, who gave it all in order to find us 
and grace us and bring us back to God. And so the radical message of the gospel is that what commends us to God is not our goodness. It is precisely our lostness and our sin that commends us to God, that moves God to act. The radical message of the gospel is that God loves you and God is for you and God is, is intent on finding you and he will find you. And so to a world that has been made weary of nibbling itself to lostness, Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. To a world that is overburdened by if-then living, if I do these things, then I'll have this, and can't keep up, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And to paraphrase Brian Mills, played by Liam Neeson in the movie Taken, Jesus says to you today, I have a particular set of skills, skills forged out of God's love in eternity, skills that make a guy like me your friend, because wherever you are, I will look for you, I will find you, and I will give you life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that no matter how lost we are, and we all are in some way, shape, or form, no matter how lost we are, you always find us. And that's why Jesus came, at great personal sacrifice. And because we can't save ourselves, we are grateful that you are a God who saves us and you are a God who loves us and that that grace changes everything. It frees us from trying to prove ourselves to simply living as people who are already approved of by you. And what a difference that makes. We can now just live as forgiven people. May that be a reality for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.